Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to start, Owen? Good to go. Great. Thank you, Zavos. I'll hand over to um, Councillor Bentley. Thank you very much indeed. Well, hello and welcome everyone to this online meeting on the 27th of July 2020 uh, of the Scrutiny Panel. I am Councillor Kevin Bentley and I'm a councillor for the Marks 10 Lair Ward and I'll be chairing the meeting this evening. Now, this evening's meeting is broadcast live via Zoom over the internet on the Council's YouTube channel and will also be available to watch afterwards. And there's a few pieces of housekeeping I just need to go through. I think everyone's done this with the exception of Councillor Barber. But could you please all go on to mute with the exception of the Democratic Services Officers and myself who'd be running the meeting. And then when uh, I invite you to speak, perhaps you can unmute yourself and those who've got their videos off our uh, uh, members of the public uh, can uh, please do that as well. I'd be very, very grateful. I will ask for each item of business to be presented and then ask the member of the panel in turn if they wish to ask questions after we've had the presentations. At the end of each item of business, uh, in this case, any one piece of business, I will ask each panel member in turn to confirm audibly how they wish to vote. And that'll be a named vote in terms of uh, Mr. Howell will read names out and members will be asked to vote uh, the for, against, or abstaining, of course. If we're still going at 7.30, then I may well ask for a break, but of course I shall consult with the panel members first to see how they wish to progress before we carry on with business or not. Uh, I've introduced myself. Uh, let's go round uh, the panel and let's start with Councillor Barber. Good evening, Councillor Lewis Barber, and I represent Lexington and Braithwaite Ward. Uh, Councillor Tina Bourne. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Councillor Tina Bourne representing Greenstead Ward. Mike Hogg. Councillor Mike Hogg, St Anne's and St John's Ward. Uh, Councillor Paul Dundas. Good evening, Councillor Paul Dundas, Stanway Ward. Councillor Lorcan Whitehead. <clears throat> Good evening, Councillor Lorcan Whitehead, Newtown and Christchurch Ward. Councillor Sam McCarthy. Evening all, Councillor Sam McCarthy representing Shrub End Ward. And Councillor Chris Hayter. Good evening, Councillor Chris Hayter, St Anne's and St John's Ward. Thank you very much. We have visiting councillors, but as they come into play in the meeting, we will uh, uh, ask them to introduce themselves and where they are from properly. So we move on to item two, a bit of agenda housekeeping to go through here, but it's essential for the well conduct of the meeting. Uh, so item two, substitutions, there are none, clearly. Uh, item three, urgent items, there are none. Declarations of interest, colleagues, anyone? <clears throat> None. I will just say that although I have no declarations of interest, just to the point of accuracy and uh, openness and, and uh, accountability, uh, I'm a resident of Mersey Island, West Mersey, uh, but there's no application, so therefore I have no uh, uh, prejudicial interest. Uh, I'm a member of Essex County Council. Essex County Council has also put a consultation response in, but we're not there to scrutinise uh, tonight or that tonight, and I've checked those facts with the monitoring officer, just so it's on the record we're clear. Item number five, general have your say. There are no speakers on general have your say. Item six, decisions taken under special urgency provisions. There are none. Item seven, cabinet or portfolio holder decisions called in for review, and this is where the main part of the business is this evening. So I just want to explain how we're going to run this, because this is a call-in, which is the response to Brad will be stage one consultation. Very shortly, we have four Have Your Say speakers. I'm going to come to you in this order, so just note where you are in the order and you know. And this is the order I believe they, they came into us, that's why we're doing it this way. Councillor Peter Banks, Councillor John Acker, who I believe is reading a statement from Mr Ian Clark, but then he'll come on. Councillor Julie Baker and Professor uh, Andrew Blowers. Um, uh, the call-in uh, councillors, I don't believe that, uh, anyone wishes to speak other than the lead member on that, who's Councillor John Jowers. Once we've had the Have Your Say speakers, we will then go to Councillor, uh, and this is the question, I believe we're allowed to put questions to uh, anyone who asks, uh, makes a statement. That's the panel members only, by the way. Um, uh, once we've had that, we'll go to the lead councillor on the call-in, who's Councillor Jowers, to put his case for the call-in. And then tonight we have the leader of the council, Councillor Mark Corey, appearing uh, on behalf of the Cabinet. Natural cabinet member is Councillor Mike Lilly. Uh, well, unfortunately, or fortunately for him, he's on holiday at the moment. Uh, therefore, in such matters, uh, issues revert to the leader of the council and council or who's most welcome is evening to respond. Once we've had that, um, we will then go into the session with members asking questions. And I just want to point out that we have three options in front of us tonight. Option one is we may confirm the decision as written. 
refer the decision back to the decision taker, in this case, Councillor Mike Lilly, um, or we might refer it to the full council if we believe that it is any way at all policy of council. Uh, now, uh, two points I just want to make before we start the, the have your say. This applies to absolutely everyone. We are here tonight to talk about the response. We're not here to talk about the rights and wrongs of nuclear power. So we just have to keep it absolutely on the money when it comes to uh, this tonight. So this is about response and the details within that response and how the response was put together. The second point, I just want to go to Mr. Weavers because I just want to check. So we're clear at the moment. I did ask Mr. Weavers this when we had the uh, mediation, which I'll mention in just a moment or two. Uh, whether we believe or he believes there is a policy at the moment of the Borough Council towards Brad will be. Mr Weavers, are you able to advise before we start? Yes, uh, thank you Chairman. Uh, it is my um, view at the moment that the Council doesn't have a definite policy regarding Brad will be. We did the research and uh, you've got some additional uh, papers in your pack which sets out in chronological order the decisions that the Council has taken in its through its various committees on this subject. Thank you, Mr. Weavers. And I, yes, I, I, and thank you for that work because I did ask. I think that may well be a crux of tonight's meeting, and therefore I thought it's very important that we had done our homework. Mr. Weavers clearly has, and thank you very much indeed for that. Final bit from me we had last week uh, a mediation session. This normally happens with a call in where the person who calls it in uh, meets the, the decision taker. They have a, a meeting to decide whether they can resolve it there and then it, or whether it needs to go to uh, the uh, scrutiny panel in full. It was a very good meeting. The notes from those have been. To panel members and there's a uh, they're in the public domain as well you can see what took place a very very good meeting but it was decided at the end for lots of reasons which i'm sure we're going to hear about tonight that this should come to the full panel and then a decision or recommendation be made from this panel so that's all from me let's move on to the have your say speakers uh, and maybe go first please to councillor peter banks Councillor Banks, you have three minutes. You will have a gavel of one minute, telling you have one minute, uh, sorry, after two minutes, telling you have one minute to wind up. And although I'm fairly generous, uh, if, if you're clearly coming to an end, I won't rush you. But if you're still going on and on and on, then I would, of course, you and everybody else just interrupt the interview. But Councillor Peter Banks, the time starts when you do. Thank you, Chair. Um, the reason I'm speaking is to really highlight the whole inadequacy of the Bradwell stage one consultation and to this end I would suggest that in preparing culture to borough council's response that the borough has effectively been ambushed not only by some of the Bradwell B propaganda but also because the whole thing occurred under the pandemic so the borough's councillors officers and staff were all concurrently in the throes of major readjustments to new ways of working while still primarily caring for your residents. West Mersey Town Council, we wrote to you on the 29th of May, well before the deadline, uh, outlining our concerns about the impact that the cancellation of the remaining public events that Brad will be proposed. Uh, I mean, they rightly cancelled them because of the onset of the pandemic. But this has had an effect on everything that has subsequently happened. And this is not only just about your residents on Mersey Island, but it's the whole of Colchester Borough and indeed uh, adjoining local authorities because they were denied the opportunity to meet with representatives of Bradwell B to ask their own pertinent questions. Uh, the subsequent uh, offering of virtual engagement also meant that not proper information was, uh, was able to be gathered and that not only prevented residents, but it also um, prevented a, a full engagement with what by Colchester Borough Council. Uh, and as it appears that certainly in part, the glossy literature that Brad will be provided has been used to populate some of your submission. For example, uh, impacts on the borough in terms of skilled labour shortages, they've been indicated as employment opportunities of Brad will be. Whereas in reality, it's radically different because we can look at what's happening currently at Hinkley Point C and historically around the Suffolk town of Leyston as size will be was being built. And also the full implications of your statutory requirements to manage emergency evacuation plans. It's not just about the uh, 
regular and routine emissions, airborne and waterborne, of radioactive discharges. It's also the chilling fact that highly toxic and lethal radioactive waste would be stored for at least 200 years within two miles of the borough's southern boundary. And where is the consideration that this may not happen, that the uh, this country is waiting for the government's revision of the energy white paper after 10 years uh, this autumn. So yes, Colchester Borough Council must resubmit a borough focused response. And Colchester Borough Council must stress both to Bradleby and most importantly, directly to the planning inspectorate that without full face-to-face -face safe public engagement with the BRB team for councillors, officers and residents to pose their questions directly and regardless of their position on nuclear power. That the stage one so consultation inadequacy makes it completely invalid. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Banks. I didn't hear the gavel, so I assume that was in the three minutes or two minutes. Or two. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'll bang it louder next time. That that yeah, was no, I, that was somewhat over, but uh, yeah. no, I didn't hear it at all. So, uh, did anyone else hear the gavel? My fault. No, okay, so we might <laughs> so bang a little harder next time. But anyway, Councillor Banks, thank you very much indeed. Right, our next speaker is Councillor John Acker. Uh, I believe, Councillor Acker, you're speaking um, on behalf of Mr. Ian Clark. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, thank you, Councillor Bentley. That's exactly what I want to do. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity of addressing the scrutiny committee. I want to read the statement by uh, Ian Clark. He states, I am unable to reconcile how the response by the council has changed from that of the last objection based on a thorough review of the outline proposals by its earlier SOSP review, supported by public consultation and endorsed by the council now changed by its failure to object, i.e. of implied acceptance of the proposal in its response after review by the officers in a li limited and primary desktop review. The response and statement at a recent council meeting suggests that it's an informal pre-application consultation for planning application to, to be decided by Malden District Council, such as may occur prior to significant local development. However, this is statutory consultation for a planning application for a nationally significant infra infrastructure project that is decided by a planning inspectorate, not Malden District Council, under which process CBC as a neighboring authority has equal influence to Malden. The planning inspector makes it clear in its introduction that stage one consultation provides the main opportunity for consultees to influence the project after which there is limited scope for a consultee such as Colchester to do that, i.e. illustrating the importance of the consultation. I am, for example, concerned that Mersey Island and evacuation under the current ONR protocol, BRB may else obtain a development consent order before a credible evacuation plan under regulations has been determined. Colchester must, for example, insist for the protection of public safety, its residents and visitors uh, is issued before the feasibility of a credible evacuation plan, if feasible, is determined. And the project should be allowed to proceed no further without this. I consider that Colchester Power Council should advise the planning inspectorate of its objection to stage one consultation for reasons of scope, etc., such as those I have provided for the council separately. I ask the bar now withdraws its submissions and submits its objection to the proposals based on earlier SOSP review and further consultation as with the affected parishes and others. May I, Councillor Bentley, say that I very, very strongly endorse um, Ian Clark's uh, statement to you. And I very much hope that the Borough Council will, will act accordingly. And I was heartened by the uh, by the by the what the um, officer put forward early on that no no firm objection has yet been put forward and i hope it will the borough will put in due course a very strong objection forward 
as representing the council's policy. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Councillor uh, Acker, thank you very much indeed, and indeed uh, via you, Mr Ian Clark, as well. Uh, Councillor Julie Baker. Thank you, sir. Uh, we were given to believe that this was of no immediate threat, as common sense would prevail, as the UK is currently working on 10% of our capacity for power. And so we would not require a power station at Bradwell that was five times larger than Bradwell A. And so what is the rush for another power station? We have more than enough energy and alternative power supplies and the increase in size of other power stations. The main trades on Mersey Island are tourism, fishing and the oyster industry. And this monstrosity on our skyline, just two miles from our shoreline, will have a dramatic effect on all of them without the vision of the huge container ships delivering and waiting to deliver to Bradwell. Common sense does not seem to be prevailing on any of the decisions being made by CBC, and I'm deeply concerned. Despite the constant reminder that we have no infrastructure on Mersey Island, thanks to Mr Liddy and his need for a planning meeting during lockdown so we couldn't have our say, we are now up to five housing estate planning applications for Mersey. Five. How on earth are we going to evacuate Mersey Island in the event of an, uh, any threat from Bradwell? Without the th threat of Bradwell being a basic threat from terrorism, we also have the threat from the five times larger pressurised water cooling systems by Bradwell B. Last week's meeting of the National Security Council sought plans to build Western alternatives to Huawei and this was approved. A so re security review into Huawei technology is due next month with GCHQ experts examining moves to America from using US technology. It appears that here we are giving them access to it on a plate. Please, please do not rush this through. What effect will this have on the fishing and oyster trades? Again, we haven't been allowed to have our say, so it hasn't been analysed. There is still low level power stores on Bradwell from Bradwell A. When it was controlled by the UK government, at least we were reassured of our safety as it was tightly controlled. Will you still feel safe? Will you be able to trust the new system and results and monitoring? The government has said that no Huawei infrastructure is to be used in the 5G networks, and surely this would include the technical computerised requirements behind Bradwell B. If you are still adamant that you or the government still needs this monstrosity, then stop agreeing to the housing developments at the very least. Health and safety does not appear to be a requirement for consideration by the planning officers, sir, but it is yours. Thank you. Mr Baker, thank you very much indeed. Uh, our last time you'll say speaker is Professor Andrew Blows. Am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. First of all, I thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak at this meeting. Um, and secondly, to say, I was very disappointed when I saw the Colchester submission because it, uh, it did not have uh, much connection at all with what was my understanding of Colchester's position, although not stated as council policy, over the last 10 years. And I've had several meetings with um, uh, the, the borough uh, members um, and uh, as I say, I'm surprised that it doesn't reflect at all the tone of the conversations that we had. And it most of all does not reflect the very excellent uh, statement made in 2010 uh, by your previous uh, scrutiny panel. And I would refer to that because much of that is still highly relevant and still I think puts the points on behalf of Colchester. Um, my point is that I think the um, it's, it's not argued that this should be objected to as a whole. In actual fact, the, um, the consultation is misleading in suggesting that uh, the choice of the site um, is a matter for government policy. And I think it led people astray, including Colchester, in not attacking the policy as a whole. Um, the issue is, is the site a suitable site? And that is very much up for discussion. And my argument would be, and the argument of Bang would be, that it is most unsuitable as a site for a new nuclear power station. 
Uh, that suitability of the site is only confirmed up to 2025 without going into a lot of technical detail. We don't yet have a statement from the government which reaffirms that site beyond 2025. Be that as it may, it seems to me that Colchester should mount an objection on the basis of the whole site problem. I would identify three aspects of that. Firstly, the massive scale of this project. Um, I was utterly amazed when I saw the proposals from uh, Bradwell B. And they were far more intrusive, dominating and comprehensive than ever I could have imagined. And I suspect other people were imagined, hence the uproar that was created by it. What we have are two huge reactors, turbine halls, radioactive waste, high level radioactive waste stores, cooling towers, tunnels into the estuary for cooling, port facilities, accommodation, transmission lines, uh, cooling towers, uh, and earthworks. The scale is immense and completely dominating and will transform the whole estuary um, from a peaceful, rural, uh, tranquil area into basically a, 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 a massive industrial site um, with all the disruption that, that involves and the long-term impacts. And it seems to me the most strong ob objection should be made on those grounds. And I, um, I, I ask uh, Colchester to do this. The second major objection ought to be on the basis of the site's vulnerability, particularly in an era of climate change, when we are heading towards at the very least three degrees C increase in temperature by the end of this century. And the, the low lying nature of the site, the fragility of the East Coast and so on, uh, suggest that um, the site is highly vulnerable. Indeed, the plan suggests that it's going to be an island eventually. And whether that, that can go into the next century when we shall still have high level waste on the site and still have decommissioning uh, in situations that are completely unknowable seems Sorry. to me unethical uh, 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 to say the very least. And again, I don't think this can be defended. And I, I believe Colchester, along with others, should, should make this very clear that the climate change forecasts suggest that the site is just simply not viable. Professor Rose, can I just hold you there a second? I've got the Democratic Office, Mr Howell, just indicating... Probably sorry, Councillor, we're now at four minutes. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. In that case, I'll, I'll quickly close. The you. emergency planning point has been made. Um, the environmental impact is colossal. I would support the view of Colchester that we need a social impacts assessment. I certainly think that is true. And lastly, might I say um, that uh, I believe the present submission is tame and timid and that um, Bang would be happy to assist in any way we can to make a much more beefed up and appropriate uh, submission. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Um, if we've learned one thing tonight, we need a better system than a gavel or a bell, because we can't. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, now, just before you uh, all disappear, can I just ask any of the panel members if they have a question for any of the Have Your Say speakers? You're allowed one question if you wish. It. No? Okay. So, can just ask the have your say speakers thank you very much can i ask you to go on to the youtube uh video links you can watch this but make sure you are on it first before you come off this it's just so we can keep the connection stable for the rest of the meeting and as you would normally do in the town hall you would sit and listen to the rest of the meeting as opposed to sitting by but only disappear off this system once you've been able to get to the youtube and you can watch it properly in the meantime can i please ask you just to turn off your cameras and thank you for your participation so far Right, now just before we go to Councillor Jowers, uh, I notice we have two um, uh, members who were part of the call-in as signatures, Councillor Goucher and Councillor Moore. You don't have to, but can I just give you the opportunity, if you wish to add anything or say anything, this is your moment to do so. Councillor Goucher, is there anything you wish to add? You don't have to, but you're welcome to if you wish. Um, oh, yeah, um, the, the, uh, the one thing that I uh, um, would want to add um, relates to um, just one part of the um, report, and it's part 14.1, um, the bit about the environment. Um, and it's this part that I feel is particularly inadequate. Um, it is simply a very short statement saying um, that because of climate emergency declaration, we have the chance, or this has the chance to create, quote, a world example of low carbon development. 
Um, it takes absolutely, it, it, the report takes no regard whatsoever of the wider environmental implications of such a large um, nuclear power station on this particular site um, with regard to the ecology of the Blackwater estuary. And um, in terms of the huge volume of cooling water um, that will be needed, um, the thousands of, of extra vehicles that will be um, um, not only um, there during the building phase, but also afterwards. Um, you know, there is more to the environment than the climate change emergency. And um, I very strongly feel that this is an example of the climate emergency being used as greenwashing um, to, to, to push to one side other environmental concerns about the effect on the Blackwater estuary. And I would have expected to have seen those wider environmental concerns reflected in this report um, rather than just that simple statement. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Coucher, thank you very much indeed. Councillor Moore, again, you don't have to, but you're welcome at this yeah. point to add anything if you wish. Could I, could I just correct, Chair, a point of order? I yes. don't know if Councillor Goucher has seen the full response because he's referring just to the report rather than the more detailed response, which it does say what he's concerned about, about the environment in terms of the water, etc. So I would say, have a look at all of the documents, Councillor Goucher, because we do talk about that and I will address that later. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Goucher has heard that. Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you. Um, just really to say that um, whatever is decided tonight, the, if there is to be a, a revised response, that the it ought to be seen before it goes off by councillors, either by being re-scrutinised or being a copy being sent to all councillors before it goes off. So that if necessary, if it's still not to our satisfaction, councillor's satisfaction, it could be called in again. That's basically all. I don't want, I would not be happy if something be whizzed, just whizzed off um, without being given the wider councillors being given the opportunity to say, well, is this what we really believe? Okay, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Moore. Thank you. Um, I'm sure someone will correct me, but I think all documents are circulated, but in this particular case, perhaps we need it highly pointed out. Uh, right, we now move on to Councillor John Jowers. Um, Councillor John Jowers, you are untimed uh, in this. Um, to put, put your case, uh, we'll then hear from uh, Councillor Corey, and then I think we open it up to the panellists then. So let, let both have their presentation and then we'll ask questions afterwards. Uh, Councillor Jowers. Well, thank you so much, Chairman. The concept of untimed is alien to me, but I could spin it out. However, um, the reason I called this in, I think the only person who touched on it effectively was Professor Blowers, which is because of a chance remark or a chance slip of the tongue by actually a pretty good councillor at the last full council meeting. And it made me think that what is our policy? Now, I assumed, easy thing to do, makes an ass out of you and me. I assumed we had a policy. And the reason for assuming that is that my maiden speech in 1996 or 1997 or whatever it was, was actually about Bradwell. And consequent to that, we had several major debates in the chamber and I just took it for granted that we had a policy. And equally, when I went to the first site meeting, where actually Councillor Lilly, Councillor Corey, Councillor Goucher, Councillor McCarthy, um, there was what I thought was just a general re-echoing of the fact that our policy was that we would oppose any further nuclear installations on, uh, on the Blackwater estuary. In fact, when the decommissioning started, I had to go over there and take the place of um, our MP, Bernard Jenkin, and my view was we've done our bit. And actually, that Magnox power station was as much as that estuary could take. So really, my main thrust is not to argue, as, you, as the chairman has said, about pro or con or again, you know, whatever, about nuclear, it's effectively that we were asking our officers to give us a report when they couldn't have known what our political policy was. They didn't know. So therefore what they've done is tried to bridge two disparate opinions. 
And I actually think quite a lot of this report is very good if you look at it in that context. Obviously, I don't agree with most of it, but we gave them an impossible task. How do they write a response when they haven't got a clue what our policy is? So my view is that we should have sent this not to BRB, it should go to the planning inspectorate. And it should be to object in principle. There are many reasons why, how it will affect the estuary. The fact that it hasn't been picked up because it's relatively new is it is now a marine conservation zone and potentially going to be a super marine, a super conservation zone. And also that Malden District Council has altered its planning, as the local planning authority, has altered its view on Bradwell. And that's not reflected in it. And of course, one could argue that that's Malden, but it's not us. But Ian Clark makes a very good point in that this is an, a nationally significant infrastructure project. And therefore, our status is exactly the same as Malden. Just for... Uh, general information is the major population center in Malden district is Malden, which is 14 miles upwind of Bradwell. Major impact in Colchester just happens to be our only piece of coastline, regularly featured in all the national papers as being one of the best places in the country to live. Population of 8,000 is a mile and a half from the proposed power station. So obviously we do have a view on it but we need to make sure that this is embedded in policy. I could go through the whole of the report and, the, and I won't because as Kevin says, there is an awful lot of this. He says CBC understands the principle of the need for a new nuclear power station and the choice of Bradwell is a potentially suitable site. Well, no, don't say that. I think we need to be far more robust in saying that, you know, we do not think it is a suitable site. Those reasons have been given by many of the previous speakers, but it's up to us to be able to formulate those as a policy of this council. Is it what we want? And you can argue, you know, the central government will have a very big, well, they will take the decision on this. My view is that actually central government would almost certainly like to hear our views. They would like to hear a policy from a large authority saying these are the reasons why not and I won't go into the background of why they might accept that. So in my view I think that the crux of this is we have to have a policy opposing a new nuclear power station. There are one or two issues one of them is that I've never yet seen an overlay of the old power station I'd had to declare an interest because I helped build it as a very young man, I hasten to add. I'd like to see that superimposed on what is going to be the proposed two reactor cooling tower disaster. Um, and I picked up again on Professor Blower's view, which is we have one of the most beautiful ancient rivers. You know, it's site of Viking battles. It's, it, it, it's just the most incredible benefits of the borough allied to the cone. The two meet at the bottom, as you know. And we are considering putting something which will look like Teesside chemical plants on it. It destroys one of the most incredible vistas that we have. And not only that, we've got the oldest church in Britain just alongside it, which is a rather unfortunate juxtaposition. So effectively, I'm not blaming Mike Lilly. It was just that he, what he said triggered my reaction. And I know it was a slip of the tongue. And equally, looking further into it, how on earth can our officers produce a response when they don't know the response that's required by us? We cannot abrogate our responsibility and expect our officers to mind read what we want. So my view is that we need to have a formal objection to this sent to the planning inspector. And I think actually a full council motion would be a very good move indeed. So. I hope I can convince you of this. Um, you know, um, there's no casting of blame. It's just that we need to get our response absolutely right. Otherwise, we'll be crucified. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I've said enough. Councillor Jarvis, thank you. We'll now move to Councillor Corey. Councillor Corey, I know you're supported by 
officers here tonight. If you need to refer to them, I'll just ask you to bring them in as and when you feel you need to. Over to you, though. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. And thank you, Councillor Jowers. And uh, it'll be good to know I agree with you. OK, <laughs> I agree with everything you've said, pretty much. Um, so let's carry on agreeing and let's see where we get to. So first of all, uh, Chair, before I do move on, I, I must declare a bit of an interest in the sense that I did um, speak at an event on behalf of Bang and other anti-nuclear um, representatives of Sizewell and others, uh, which Councillor Jail has referred to. And I have also um, attended alongside Bang uh, a, a meeting at the Environment Agency with the nuclear regulator uh, to actually support them in their opposition and to go through the environmental impacts, the security impacts, and all the negative impacts that I believe are to do with Bradwell Nuclear. So that's some of the reason why I do absolutely agree with John. And I agree with Councillor Giles's points because um, he's right. I, I thought there was a, a clear policy. And actually the former leader, Councillor Smith, sort of replied to a response in about 2015 from a member of the public speaking at full council saying, uh, we still have the same policy of objecting to uh, nuclear power. And that kind of fooled me into thinking we, we had that policy. So it's only through um, checking, checking through all the documents to me find where we are, which is actually that we had a portfolio holder response on the back of a very good piece of work done by the scrutiny panel and done by an excellent task and finish group of which I was on and some other councillors here may have been on as well, which was uh, really, really informative. So we did those, those pieces of work then in response to a government consultation on new nuclear across a number of sites. And we did object um, based on the local impacts. And again, like other councillors have said, we didn't say yes or no on, on nuclear power as a strategic energy use across the country, but we talked about the local impact because that's how our residents would be impacted and that's how we wanted to protect our residents. So our response does go through a number of key issues, but I do agree it needs to be more robust. I do agree with Peter Banks when he spoke that during the pandemic was not the right time to have this consultation. It was right to, to not have face-to-face -face consultation during that period, but our submission said we want to see face-to-face -face consultation occur once the COVID crisis and uh, the COVID uh, secure two meters, etc., cetera, were, were lifted, the lockdown. So we would like to see further consultation and further information. So far, we've got glossy brochures and promises of this and promises of that. We don't have the specifics about it, but I do agree with John. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Jowers, as so does Mike Lilly, Councillor Lilly, that actually we don't think um, the estuary can cope anymore. We don't think um, it coped in the first place. I, I've seen the evidence uh, from that task and finish group, the bleaching of the shorelines, the destruction of habitats, the destruction of the habitat in which our world-renowned Colchester oyster uh, breeds and the changes of temperature. Because when you use water to cool in a cooling tower, of course the water will come out much warmer. And also it comes out chlorinated because we know they take it in off the sea, they have to clean it as it goes through the system and out it comes with extra chlorine in it. So for all of those reasons, and, and like Councillor Jowers, I won't go on about it tonight, but I really am passionate about the local impacts and how they are detrimental. So I do completely understand with the problem that we have here and appreciate the scrutiny of it actually. And Councillor Jowers summed it up unsurprisingly good orator uh, very well saying that it's kind of the officers had an impossible task and I, I do apologize on that front because during COVID we were focusing on the response to protecting our residents and for this we, we did not have the opportunity to give more capacity uh, and actually to to carry out a full uh, political process in a sense and that's where again I would agree and I will actually put to you as the scrutiny panel tonight that I've spoken to officers, I've spoken to the portfolio holder, and I believe that taking it to an extraordinary full council meeting is the way forward that we should do uh, in this unique circumstance as soon as possible. So that's something I can put to you. And I've even uh, sort of worked on a suggested motion that we could put in, which will just say about the local impacts and objection. But actually, from what Councillor Jowers has said, I think we can work on uh, working on improving that, talking about the in principle objection to the planning inspectorate, I think is a really good point. Um, 
and actually to put in a motion that we have a policy ongoing that is regularly updated uh, because we seem to have regular uh, examples of of nuclear coming back round as a, as a cycle uh, at Bradwell. So I do agree it's nationally significant and we should go to the planning inspector. I do agree that we should actually take this to full council. So I, I will put that proposal to you when I've finished just summing up. So I thank Peter Banks for his, his contribution. I do agree with most of what he said there about cancelling of events, although it was right at the time, it does not then complete a full consultation and I would want to see that it says it in our uh, submission that wasn't good enough. It does refer to our last decision from 2010 I must say but uh, I think we should have focused on that more. So I am happy to to uh, look at a more robust response but on the back of uh, a, full con uh, a full council discussion on it and I hope uh, Councillor Jowers and, and others we will win that argument to say despite what councillors think about national nuclear as a strategy, the Bradwell uh, site, the Blackwater estuary and the effect upon Mersey is not uh, positive for our borough, for protecting our residents, for having an emergency plan. You know uh, more than I do how it will not be adequate, whatever happens for Mersey Island. So we need to protect our residents on Mersey Island, um, as Councillor Baker said and, and uh, Councillor Acker said. So I thank them for their, their submissions. And I do, as I said during Councillor Goetsch's remarks, want to explain that we did have a, a deeper report. I don't know if you, you just didn't see that, where we do talk about the environmental impacts, which I've referred to. And I said I won't go into any more in detail, otherwise we'll be here all night. But I do want to thank those speakers uh, because I do think they've contributed well. Um, so my, my proposal to you and... Um, Richard Clifford, if you'd be able to bring up on the screen, I have, as a school teacher, uh, want to put forward a sort of exam question for an extraordinary full council meeting, that we, we start with this wording, Chairman, and, and perhaps from uh, Councillor Jowers' submission uh, earlier, that we add in uh, an objection in principle uh, to the planning inspectorate, or at least uh, talk about having a policy in the background. And I think it's more about a stance. It's about a policy that is a stance of the council that we believe we understand the local impacts of nuclear power at Bradwell. And I, I fully appreciate that out of the 51 councillors we have, some will have differing opinions on nuclear power as the right way to be part of a, a wider energy mix. I personally did study a course at university and think it's, it's not part of the energy mix we need going forward. However, those power stations that are currently not decommissioned, you could have a pragmatic approach about them uh, being used to the end of their life. There's, there's much more I could say about the security of the site, but essentially we want to um, ensure we're protecting our residents. Those explained as the closest being at Mersey, but the whole borough. And, and really, um, I would say you've got three decisions within a scrutiny call-in. As we understand, we don't really have a policy so it can't really be contrary to a policy. And you could put it back to the portfolio holder. So what I've done is made sure I've spoken with Mike as portfolio holder. I'm here representing him tonight. And what I'd say is that actually we'd accept withdrawing that submission, taking it to an extraordinary full council meeting and ensuring a further response is more robust in the way that I've discussed, in the way that Councillor Jowers has uh, discussed. What I would say is I'm not making a habit of extraordinary uh, full council meetings. This is quite a unique situation where we haven't had the chance due to COVID to really discuss it, but also because it's such a strategically national important uh, issue that goes beyond our borough. I feel it's one that in this unique situation we could have a discussion at full council on. So I'm more than happy to take further questions, um, Chair, and, and talk about any of those issues. Uh, there was one step I think that Peter Banks talked about that I just wanted to pick up on. Oh, he talked about the planning inspectorate as well. So uh, in, in line with Councillor Jowers, just going on a matter of principle to the planning inspectorate is probably another level we can take uh, when revising our submission. So thank you for that. It was um, a short deadline, first of uh, sort of early July, we had to put it in. So we will take more time. It did say that our response could be changed based on a call in. So we'll do just that. Thank you. 
Mr. Corey, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this could end up being the shortest call in in history, I would have thought, with everyone violently agreeing on the ever seen that before. So that's quite good. Um, so, just uh, so we're clear on a couple of things, thank you for sight of that suggested motion. Of course, that's not a matter for scrutiny, that's a matter for you and the leaders of the parties to bring to full council. But thank you for letting us see sight of it. That's very useful. We can discuss the principle of it, but not the actual motion itself. Um, and you've made a, a, an offer, which uh, will go to colleagues and see what they think, indeed, whether they need to ask any further questions, because it's quite a precious offer. So I'm going to go uh, in the order we started with, as I usually do, and then I will reverse if we have further questions. Can I go first? Sorry. Is there... I'm sorry. Um, I just noted that um, uh, Mr. Vipon's hand has been raised. He may want to oh. just speak before. Right, thank you. I, I can't see that, so you'll have to tell me. Thank you. Right. Uh, Mr. Vipond. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a moment. Uh, I think it is clear what Councillor Corey said in the end, but um, we are certainly suggesting that technically you are amending a, um, uh, a representation. Uh, you're not withdrawing it and starting again. That would be, uh, uh, I think, technically uh, uh, in inappropriate, given that we, uh, we are past the deadline for responses. So we, uh, if you could just bear in mind, I think that's what we are, that is what you are considering doing. Uh, is uh, mending and I think many have said there are some uh, some useful phrases in the long representation which was submitted so you probably don't want to uh, get rid of all of it but you can amend at will. Thank you Mr Vipon of course that again that's not our decision our decision is either to accept refer back or full council that's what we absolutely yes we exactly. need to do but thank you for that point uh, right let me now go to then Councillor Lewis Barber Thank you, Chair, and thank you to uh, Councillor Corey and Councillor Jowers uh, for presenting this evening. I, I, it was actually very interesting hearing a lot of the points they raised because certainly in the five years since I've been uh, elected, I can't, um, four, four, four years I've been elected, I can't recall um, debating uh, Bradwell. I, I'm not too well versed in the merits of it or, or, the, or the cons. Uh, for it. So it's good to hear some of those points this evening. And Councillor Jowers, I think, struck a particular point with me about how it'd be an abrogation of responsibility not to have a clear policy on the issue. And certainly, if I was an anorak with a clipboard in Whitehall and I was looking at this uh, consultation response, I would say that it was generally something where we're, where we're saying as an authority, actually, we're kind of happy with a few amendments to let this go ahead. And my feeling is that's not necessarily the authority's position. That's, as has been said, not particularly anyone's fault. Uh, there was just assumptions made. Um, and I think now is, there is an opportunity to take a clear line, whatever that stance is. And uh, I'm certainly sympathetic, my personal view, sympathetic to the motion that Councillor Corey has put in. As I've always said, theory and reality have to meet at some point. And if there's clear deficiencies, then that would be for the authority uh, to make that clear statement. So I, for one, would be happy putting a recommendation forward to go to full council. It'd be very useful to hear the arguments that have been put forward by the speakers as well from the public, who were very articulate on the matter, and, and also the two councillors who presented this evening. Uh, I, I would like to hear those debates, and I'd like us to take a firmer view on the issue uh, for our local residents. I strongly believe in that open democracy on all issues, and it would be it's certainly important here too. It's such a clearly important issue. And as Councillor Jow said, I do think the government would be interested in hearing local views. The MPs are involved on the issue, so it would make sense for us to have a clear stance as well. So that would be my recommendation to take it to full council. Thank you. Councillor Barber, thank you. Uh, as we go through other colleagues, they may wish to second or put another proposal forward, but we are limited in what we can propose here, bearing in mind. Uh, the order will be uh, Councillor Bourne, Councillor Hogg, Councillor Dundas, Councillor White, Councillor McCarthy and Councillor Hayter. Uh, we are, I mean, while it's nice to hear people, we are meant to be asking questions as well. Feel free to do so or not, as the case may be. Councillor Bourne. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. I don't have any questions. I do support the approach laid out by Councillor Corey. Uh, in consultation with the portfolio holder, Councillor Lilly. And uh, I think a special full council would give everyone an opportunity, as Councillor Barber has outlined, he hasn't had the opportunity in the time that he's been on the council to hear the debate, but I certainly do remember the debate that we had many, many years ago. Uh, and I think it's now is a good time to revisit that. Um, for all sorts of reasons, because we, a, a number, this is not just a local issue, this is a Colchester issue, this is a regional issue, and it's a national issue. 
and um, I, I think all the contributions today are very fair um, and well thought out and I know that there will be some other contributions should we have a full council meeting that will be equally um, enthralling. So uh, now is a good time to have that debate about nuclear um, and it can be you know, that can be widened out. So um, I support the approach um, as stated. Yeah. Um, I would second that if there was a... Yes, no, that's fine. Thank you. That, that's useful. Um, Councillor Bourne, thank you. I would, I would just say as well, what's highlighted, what, which is why I asked Councillor Weaver, sorry, Mr Weaver's to look into this, is about, because uh, yes. I remember that debate, uh, if I'd have left that meeting as I did all those years ago, I'd have thought that was the policy, but clearly we haven't had one. So how we make formal policy, I think, is something we just need to look at as a result of this. It's highlighted that very clearly. Right, Councillor Hogg. Thank you, Chairman. Um, having listened to the previous speakers, um, and even if I were convinced of the financial and uh, ecological viability of this, you're still left with the suitability of the location. Um, Given, in, given uh, the, as we've been told earlier, that the amount of pending planning applications sitting waiting to be decided on issues, housing issues for the island, an evacuation plan would be absolutely crucial to, to this whole plan. Um, my question is, are we working on the 2009-10 evacuation plan or has that been uprooted, upgraded, sorry, upgraded, um, to more recent times, or are we still looking at an evacuation plan which is 10 years out of date? Thank you. Councillor Corey, you may know the answer. If not, I'm sure one of your officers will. Yes, I, I'm not sure if officers can come in. That might be the same answer as mine, but uh, because there has been no further new nuclear at this point, so we have, we have the concern of flooding over onto um, disposed uh, nuclear, but otherwise, um, the plan would have been based on the old site functioning and actually we will need to get a new one if if the new station gets up and running so uh, that's something we would need to develop and get further uh, stuck into and something we need government help with as well with the nuclear regulation authority thank you so that sounds like no we haven't got any further update <laughs> we are where uh, we are okay, absolutely. thank you thank you um uh, councillor paul dundas Thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you for everybody's contribution so far. I certainly don't intend to break with the violent agreement going on this evening. Um, as others have said, um, I think there's probably only three members of this panel who would have been councillors and discussed, been around when this was discussed before, and probably less than 50% of, of, of full council. Um, uh, there's a quite a lot of talk um, in the documents about the um, task and finish group which was set up. It, it, I, I haven't actually seen what came out of that. Um, I'm sure it's available somewhere. It would, might be quite useful for that to be made available to councillors in advance of any um, extraordinary full council because I think there's probably a lot of questions already been answered, a lot of things already been discussed and I think it would be quite useful for to educate people. Um, as Councillor Jowers said, um, just seeing a, a, a plan of the new new one superimposed over the old. I haven't seen that. That would also be very useful. I don't know if it is available out there anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I would support what everybody said so far. Um, the, 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 there's no doubt that reading, for the reasons we've already um, discussed, it wasn't anybody's fault. But when you read the submission and when you listen to what people are saying here tonight, and when you listen to what some people said uh, in full council a couple of weeks ago, it is fairly clear to me that that submission does not seem to chide with people's comments or views because um, it does really say, it does say as Councillor Jow said in, in black and white that we are accepting the principle of building a nuclear power station um, at, at Bradwell and I'm not sure we do in fact I think having listened to people I think it's fairly clear that a lot of people don't so yes I'll, I'll, I'll back it again to full council um, I think it's already been seconded, so it doesn't need seconding again. Um, and I suspect others will as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Dundas. Councillor Whitehead. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to, to, to everyone who's contributed. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have any questions myself, um, and I don't want to repeat things that other people have said. I um, I support the, um, the proposal that Councillor Corey and Councillor Lilly have, have come up with. Um, I think it would be good to have a debate 
um, on the policy and um, and give people a chance to comment on that. Um, I think, yeah, as others have said, it's uh, it doesn't seem to reflect the views that everyone's everyone's putting forward now. So I think that would be a positive thing. So that's it for me. Thank you. As well, thank you, Councillor McCarthy. Thank you very much. I'd actually prepared a whole spiel um, of trying to convince people to take this to full council, but it seems like that's not actually going to be necessary now. Um, I've been deeply concerned about Bradwell B for years. I remember being a kid and being a bit freaked out by it, by the whole idea of it. Um, I'm concerned about the environmental impacts, the visual impact, the impact on local residents. Again, I think most of this I, I might say for that full council meeting. But I welcome Councillor Corey's uh, comments this evening. It looks like we're going to support it. Um, so no questions from me. And I'm just really grateful that we're all on the same page with this. Thank you. Councillor Heater. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, no other questions. No surprise, really, considering what everyone's uh, gone through tonight. Uh, seems to be quite uh, an agreement across the board on it. Um, really interesting to hear um, what Councillor Giles was saying earlier with, with a bit of the history behind it all. Um, and, and you know how we've got to this point here. Um, it certainly seems to feel like it's gone a little bit under the radar um, to, to what we all feel individually and, and again, collectively. Um, so yeah, definitely um, back in it, get, getting it to full council so we can we can debate this properly. Thank you. Mr. Hayter, thank you. Just a, uh, so I think we've got a conclusion which I'll come to in just a second. I just have a technical question. I don't really mind who answers it, but formally I'll just ask the leader, but it might be somebody else. So we, we're in a situation, aren't we, where we have a response that's gone in, that's then been called in, which seems a little unusual. Normally there'd be a five day calling period, you'd then debate it, then as a result, you'd either refer it back and then it goes in. So in effect, it's difficult to do item two, really, referring something back that's already been submitted having said that and we must not get into the habit we must i know there's reasons around this but we must not get in to the habit of putting responses then call them in retrospectively as it were however uh, mr vipon did talk about amending the response i'm a little unclear how we're going to amend that now since the response has gone in so could someone just clarify me what we're going to amend that to on the basis we're going to have a special full council meeting are we waiting for that and then amend it or not so Councillor Bentley, what I would suggest actually is, is you, you sort of take my proposal, which I absolutely uh, is, is a cast iron guarantee, and I've got um, two group leaders here this evening. I've spoken to the Highwoods Independents and they'd be happy to take it to an extraordinary full council meeting as well, so all group leaders would support it. Um, that actually you could, you could go for referring it back to the portfolio holder, because actually that's what needs to, we need to uh, make it more robust submission. In the meantime, we have a special, uh, an extraordinary full council meeting because we can't actually make policy at full council. What we can give is a clear stance, uh, a motion, uh, but we won't be able to write the detail. And that will then give the guidance back to, to what exactly we, we do in our submission. Because I think we can say in full council that submission should be more robust. Uh, and we believe on these particular angles, we should be really firing back in our submission. Uh, and I think the, the really good point has been made about going higher to the, the planning inspectorate to say what well, for, for these principled reasons, we believe so as well. So I actually feel that we've got two things you could do tonight. One is to to absolutely understand that um, I've been working with the Democratic officers to, to try and find a date, hopefully, where we can have a, a full council meeting. And actually, you could say, well, we want the portfolio holder to, to make this more robust. So I actually think that as I say, I restate, we can't make policy actually on the hoof at the meeting, but we can definitely inform it and then go back with um, something much more robust, which we will uh, we will try and ensure that, as uh, Councillor Moore said, all members get to see um, that submission and hopefully all members will be happy with it uh, when it goes back. And, and I think we've already taken the points from tonight and we'll feed those into the, the debate, but we'll feed that back to the portfolio holder as well. And I will definitely take a lead role in this as well, because I'm very keen that we do and keen that we take on the points we've got tonight. And the points of Bang, I'd happily support Bang's public statement on it uh, on the power station as well. Thank you. Um, I'll just say, I think going to full councils, never making policy on the hoof. That is the debating chamber where good policy is made. I would say that the, the, the cabinet can accept or not. Um, policy should not sit with 10 people, it should sit with everyone, I think. Anyway, um, that, that aside, I, I just, I, so I'm a little unclear still on the status of the response at the moment. Can I just be advised, uh, is, it can be amended, we've said that, have we? So we know what the status is. I think it's important that all the members of the panel know 
what exactly we're doing. So what is the status of the response that has been submitted, please? Mr Chairman, um, uh, Ian Vipond has raised his hand. Thank you. Mr Vipond. Mr Chair, just to be clear, there was a deadline. Uh, a response was submitted within the deadline uh, given, but it was clear in that response uh, that we have a democratic process which enables uh, responses such as that to be called in for scrutiny uh, and therefore it was uh, liable that it could be amended uh, and I think that's where we are. Um, so in that context uh, we believe we can be amendments can be made to it uh, and uh, resubmitted. It is obviously um, just a point of fact that the deadline for those responses on this consultation uh, has uh, passed, uh, but we would hope uh, that because we gave that caveat to the original response uh, that any amendments will be respected. And that will, of course, then be the council's position in any uh, subsequent um, yeah. examination of um, of the evidence at a later date. So I heard the words we hope. I think we need to know, don't we? Um, because hoping is one thing, knowing is something else. Because so, there's a chance then they could ignore an updated response. Is that correct? Well, I think it. I, mean, I would like to, to give an. So it's not. I think and I hope we need to know, don't we? Yeah, I'd like to give an absolute. What we have at the moment is an undertaking that they will uh, consider any amendments that we made. Uh, in the end, we will, in any event, get a further consultation uh, uh, period. So consultation has not ended on this uh, yeah. proposal. Yeah. So in terms of the Borough Council's position at any future inquiry, there is plenty of time to, to position that. In terms of, as I say, uh, the nature of this early consultation, uh, we would hope that our uh, amended uh, representations are given the appropriate uh, weight. Thank you for that. I think it will be useful is if the leader, as a result of whatever we decide tonight, were to write an urgent letter tomorrow explaining that if we are going to do, it sounds like we are, that we are going to amend that uh, that response, that I think we should indicate that very quickly, not just send one in, that we should indicate that's happened as a result of this procedure we're going through this evening. I think I saw Councillor Barber with your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was just picking up on that, I hope, uh, comment uh, from Ian. I was just wondering if this is a typical disclaimer we put in on consultation responses uh, so that we can subsequently amend them because sending them just as a, as a question of process, do we just send them usually? And then if it's not something that uh, the council actually sort of supports that we then later amend at a later date and whether that's something we've done before and whether that was permitted, uh, I was just wondering if this situation has occurred before and how successful that has been in the past, because it, it raises an interesting point of process in how we submit consultation responses, because it looks a bit strange if we submit them and then sort of figure out the policy afterwards and then have to amend them. That doesn't seem a very efficient way to operate or democratic. Uh, way so, to operate. so uh, obviously the, um, the, the, the council will seek to get its responses in by any deadline in that consultation of course that we get we get many consultations from many uh, uh, organizations government issue consultations on a regular basis and we uh, we always seek to uh, get the responses in by the deadline sometimes in terms of the the processes involved we can't can't guarantee to get any call-in period into that process so we have on a um, uh, when necessary, uh, issued uh, responses sub to the, subject to that very caveat that they are subject to uh, call in, and in that context, we may change uh, the the response that's been submitted. Um, ultimately, uh, for many of those, uh, that's not an issue because uh, there's not that many consultations that are called in. Uh, by uh, by scrutiny, but on uh, on occasions that it is, we would always argue that we we made it very clear that we had the democratic ability 
to amend that uh, response and that the subsequent response would be our uh, formal uh, formal um, uh, opinion. Thank you very much. That's very kind, Mr. Can I just, because I think it's important we just get it absolutely right. How long do you think we would need to wait for if that letter goes in from the leader to say the response is coming? Because it seems the sequencing to me is we put the letter and say it's coming. We have a special full council meeting, which sets a policy, which then sets the tone for the, the amended response. Seems to be the better sequencing to me. Unless one violently disagrees, please say so. If we were to do it that way round and we convened a special council meeting in three, four weeks' time, or whatever the case would be, and, and the leader and, and cabinet to do that, um, then would that would that still be okay? We'd put the caveat letter in to say so. Do we think? Anyone? I think that's that's the best way, Kevin. Yeah. I, I do agree with you. Um, I, I would go for that. I've. I did ask the Democratic officers uh, this morning about a date, and it's very tight in August, but I think it's the quicker, the better. Um, yeah. Although it does require lots of research for many people, but uh, I do think the quicker turnaround, the better, bearing in mind the discussion we just had about circumstances. At least you know most people are going to be here, even if it be in Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland, but we'll be here mostly. So that's good. Um, and even if you're not, you still join, of course, as well. So, look, I think that seems to be... Uh, I'm just trying to get the sequence right. That seems the best thing, because otherwise we're asking... Uh, Councillor Lilly to perform the impossible by amending something before we've had the debate, and that just seems much, much more sensible to me. I think Mr. has been very helpful in his answers as well. So, uh, on that basis, then, um, as I understand it, and, and Councillor Barber, I do not wish to put words in your mouth or indeed the leader, but I think this is I've got it correct uh, that we will go to a special full council meeting to decide on the policy of Bramble B, from which uh, uh, an amended response will go in. And in the meantime, the leader would write a letter probably tomorrow and the next day to uh, confirm that a further response is coming as a result of this. Is, does that sound right to people? If anyone violently disagrees with that, please just come on and let me know. That seems the right sequence. And, and uh, leader, can I just check that you're comfortable with that as well? Because obviously we'll make sure this, this happens in terms of that sequence. Yes, thank you. And it, it requires um, a minimum of five councillors to, to actually set up a an extraordinary council meeting and uh, I've, I've got a number of councillors who are happy to do that and I'm sure you'd like to add to your uh, to, to the list. Yes. Uh, we can do it as group leaders as well because I have actually that might be useful. all group leaders so yeah. if we do it that way as well as Councillor Lily I think it's fair yes. uh, so we'll do that. Um, we'll do that this evening, tomorrow I, I will send an email around to all um, to get that started so um, very happy to do that and as you say um i think it's the right thing to do that i send a letter now and then the um, full council uh, discussion informs the stance that we take which we then write in more robustly to our response thank you very much indeed um can i just check with councillor john jowers that you are uh, happy to well I mean, it's our decision but you're happy about the conversations being we will decide in a minute on a vote Yes, I think it it makes it very clear, and we we need that clarity to go ahead. Because if this does start to build up, we need a very firm basis for any objections yes. we may have. So yes. you know, at least it clarifies the political side of the organisation. It actually gives some security to our officers as well. They know where they're coming from, yeah, and that. also and also current and future portfolio holders as well. Uh, well, absolutely, and not only that, local MPs, because you know we haven't touched on the outside external influences that may come onto this. But our arguments, because we're at the sharp end, may well have some bearing on the on on the Westminster cohort. So I'm, I'm pleased okay. with that. Lovely. Okay. Well, we just need to make sure that we're pleased with it because it's the screening committee who will decide. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Mr. Howell whether he could just read back what we're about to vote on. If you're happy to do so, I can run through it again. If you could, please, Mr. Chairman, yeah. yes. No, that's absolutely fine. So what we've said is that uh, we will, um, we're not referring to full council because it's a special full council. So I think we'd say we'd, a full council meeting should be held to debate the policy on the future of Brad will be. From that, a response will be uh, amended by the cabinet member, uh, that people will have their say in all of that uh, full council meeting. And the leader will, as of tomorrow, write a formal letter to uh, the consultation to say a further amended response is coming from Colchester Borough Council. I think I've captured all that in there. 
Right, on that basis then, and, and as I come around, if anyone is unclear and wants to ask a question, if you're on just say so, or just go straight to the boat, it's entirely up to you. So, uh, let's start, we'll go in the order we have been going in. Uh, Councillor Barber, it's your motion actually. Thanks, Chair. No, I, I just want to stress, uh, make a final comment. I don't want to end on a sour note, but I don't think in future we should be in a position where we're making policy after a consultation response. I think the internal processes of the council should be in a position where we are not leaving a submission to the last moment. And I recognise the unique circumstance of this during the pandemic, but I just think in future, uh, this shouldn't, shouldn't happen, quite yeah. frankly. But uh, apart from that, I'm, I'm all done. Are you for? Oh, sorry, was that a vote? Oh, yes, for. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I did say that, yes, yes. Oh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, for, sorry, yeah. Actually, I'm bigger pardon, Mr. How you should be doing this, not me, shouldn't you, if you're going through this. That's why, sorry, that's well, um, oh yes, blame, on, yeah, blame it on me. Blame on me. Oh, it's exactly happy to delegate, Mr. Chairman, but I, I, yes, I can take it from here. Uh, so Councillor Bentley, uh, four. Councillor Bentley, four. Councillor Bourne, four. Four. Councillor Dundas, four. Four. Councillor Hater, four. Four. Councillor Hogg, four. Four. Councillor McCarthy, without a shadow of doubt, four. Four. Councillor Whitehead. Four. Four. I make that a unanimous uh, um, uh, approval, uh, Mr Chairman. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. That's extremely kind. So we've concluded the call-in. There's one little final piece of business on the order paper, which is item eight. Items requested by members of the panel and other members, there are none, but we just have to formally report back. Can I just thank you? Uh, first of all, I think to Councillor Bourne, who's on holiday, clearly, and has joined us very much such as the power of modern technology but nonetheless we've eaten into your holiday thank you for coming on it's very kind can i thank all officers um who are involved in the call-in uh, uh from the democratic side but also officers who are here some have spoken some haven't mr vipond uh and others thank you very much indeed for that can i thank visiting councillors councillor jowers and councillor corey uh, and also of course councillor moore and councillor goucher and also our public have your say people as well, who I think probably are still listening. But I would like to say a special thank you to Mr. Howell, who once again has been magnificent in turning this around in a very fast time, both mediation and this meeting and got all the paperwork out as well. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you, thank Mr. Chairman. Yeah. yeah, on that note, thank you very much indeed, everyone. Have a good rest of the evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.